Is were low over the water. Simon kicked hard, caught the branch, and held on to it. The water tried to pull him away. He took a deep breath and blew strongly into Christine's mouth again, and this time he was sure she took a breath by herself afterwards. It took him nearly five minutes to pull her onto the bank. When they got there, he put her on the ground, breathed into her mouth again, and then felt for her heart. At first he couldn't find it. His hands were too cold. Then, yes, it was beating. For another five minutes he helped her breathe until he was sure she could do it by herself. Then he began to shiver. The wind made his wet clothes cold on his body. He wondered what to do. Then he looked down and saw that Christine's eyes were open. Chris, he said, are you all right? She said something, but very quietly and he could not hear it. He lay down and put his arms around her to keep her warm. He could feel her heart beating and her body breathing under him. Simon began to cry. 11. The Public Inquiry Two days later, the inquiry began. Scientists came from London to ask questions about the disease that was killing the seals. Before he had gone to Scotland, John had been to see David Wilson about the inquiry. David Wilson had asked John to speak for the company. You're our chief biologist, John, he said. You're an important man. They'll believe you. John said nothing. He didn't want to speak at the inquiry, but he knew he had to. David Wilson smiled, or at least his mouth smiled. But his eyes watched John carefully, all the time, like the cold eyes of a fish. Think carefully about what you say, John. If you say the wrong thing next week, Hundreds of people will lose their jobs. And the first person to lose his job will be you, John. I promise you that. The inquiry room was crowded. There were a lot of journalists and photographers there. And a lot of people from the town and the factory, too. John's train was late, and he caught a taxi from the station. When he came into the room, he saw Simon sitting with the journalists. Christine was near him, with Andrew and some young people from Greenworld. John smiled at her, but she didn't smile back. She looks very white and ill, he thought. It's probably the baby. He remembered how ill his wife Rachel had been in the mornings before Christine was born, and he smiled sadly to himself. Mr. John Duncan, please. He walked to the front of the room. As he sat down, he saw David Wilson's cold, grey eyes watching him from the other side of the room. That man should be up here instead, he thought. He should tell his own lies. A lawyer began to ask him questions. At first it was easy. John explained how long he had worked for the company and how much paint the factory produced. Then the lawyer asked about the waste products. These are very dangerous chemicals, aren't they? The lawyer said. Well, yes, of course. John answered. Most chemicals are dangerous if people aren't careful with them. 
but we're very careful with them in our factory. Everyone wears special clothing. We haven't had a single serious accident in three years. I'm pleased to hear it, said the lawyer. But what happens outside the factory? Do you really put these very dangerous chemicals into the river? Yes, we do, said John. There was a noise in the room. Someone near Christine shouted something angrily, and a policewoman told him to be quiet. John went on. Of course we put these chemicals in the river, but we don't put a lot in. Only two or three hundred litres every day, that's not much. And we check the river all the time, three times every day. There are usually only two parts per million or less in the water near the factory, and there's much less downstream. That's not dangerous. Not dangerous, Mr. Duncan, said the lawyer slowly. Are you sure? Yes, I am, John said. He looked up at the hundreds of eyes watching him. David Wilson's eyes. Christine's eyes. Simon's. I understand, the lawyer said slowly, that there has been an experiment with some rats. Some mother rats were given these chemicals in their drinking water, and some of their babies were born without legs. Is that right, Mr. Duncan? John looked at the lawyer for the first time. He was a small, uninteresting-looking man, in grey clothes, with grey hair, and a thin face. He looks like a rat himself, John thought. The man's eyes were small and bright, and for some strange reason he had a newspaper in his hand. John began to feel afraid of him. Yes, he said. That's right. But rats are much smaller than people, and they were given nearly five parts per million in their drinking water for ten days. That's very different. No one drinks the river water. It goes straight out to sea. He looked at the lawyer and waited for the question about the seals. But it didn't come. Instead, the lawyer said, So, you won't be worried, Mr. Duncan, if someone falls into the river by accident and drinks a lot of river water? Your own daughter, for example. There's no danger in an accident like that. Is that right? John looked at Christine across the room. How big her eyes look in that white face, he thought. It must be because of the baby. No, he said. There's no danger at all. There was the sound of voices in the room. The lawyer smiled a small, rat-like smile. He held his newspaper out towards John. You've been away in Scotland, Mr. Duncan, he said. Have you seen this? As John read the newspaper, his hands began to shake, and he had to hold the side of the table. There was a picture of Christine, standing up in a boat near the factory, and another picture of her, lying in an ambulance with Simon beside her. The headline said, Biologist's daughter nearly drowns in river. There was a long silence. He tried to read the newspaper carefully but there was something wrong with his eyes. And his head was full of pictures of Christine in the river drowning, and his wife, Rachel, drowning in the storm long ago. 
He shook his head quickly from side to side, then took his glasses off and cleaned them. No, he said in a quiet voice. I haven't read this before. It's all right, Mr. Duncan, said the lawyer softly. Your daughter is safe. Her husband saved her, and she hasn't lost her baby. But she did drink a lot of river water. It was near the factory, too. You're not worried about that, are you? The lawyer's bright eyes were staring at him, like a rat has just seen its food. Behind him, David Wilson suddenly stood up. That is a terrible question, he shouted into the silence. You can't ask a man questions like that. Of course he's worried about his daughter. You must stop this inquiry at once. Just a minute, Mr. Wilson, said the lawyer. Mr. Duncan can go in a minute. He just has to answer one question. Are you worried? Because your daughter has drunk so much river water, Mr. Duncan. Are you worried about her baby? John Duncan stared at the lawyer with fear in his eyes. Suddenly he hated him. He picked up the newspaper and threw it into the little man's rat-like face. Yes! he shouted wildly. Yes! 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 Of course I'm worried about the baby. Of course it's dangerous. Now let me go. He ran down the room, out of the door, into the street. A hundred staring eyes watched him go. Twelve. The future. Six months later, John Duncan was living in a small flat near the sea. He had lost his job and had had to sell his expensive house. He couldn't afford the payments on it. From a window in his flat, he could look at the sea. He sat and looked at the cold grey sea for hours every day. Christine would have her baby soon. He had bought lots of baby clothes to give her. His bedroom was full of baby clothes. Little pink coats and trousers for a girl, blue ones for a boy. There were little soft toys, too. Teddy bears and small animals with blue, empty eyes. But he hadn't given any of these things to her, because she wouldn't talk to him. When he went to see her, she closed the door in his face. When he rang, she put the phone down. When he wrote, she sent the letters back unopened. There were a lot of books and magazines in his bedroom, too, but he kept them under his bed. He read them sometimes at night, but he didn't like to see them during the day. They were about babies, and the diseases that babies could get before they were born. There were some terrible things in the books, terrible pictures. He didn't like to think about them, but he couldn't stop. He thought about them all day, all the time. Today, as he sat staring out of the window at the sea, he could not stop his hands shaking. Every morning he rang the hospital to ask if his daughter Christine MacDonald was there. He had rung this morning, and a nurse had said yes, Christine was there, and the baby was coming. That had been four hours ago. For two hours, John had sat by the telephone, 
afraid to ring the hospital again. Three times he had picked it up, and three times he had put it down again. He picked it up again, and rang the number. Seven, five, eight, three. It was no good. He put the phone down again. He could not hear the news from the cold voice of a nurse over the telephone. He had to see the baby for himself. He got up, put on his coat, and went downstairs. There was a cold wind outside, blowing from the sea. The sea and the sky were grey and miserable. He went into a shop. And bought some flowers. He chose them carefully, bright red and yellow colours. And the shopkeeper put paper around them to keep them safe. John took them, and walked quickly, nervously, along the windy road by the sea, towards the hospital. It was raining out at sea. Already, the rain was falling on the sandbanks where the seals used to live. Soon, it would be falling on the town. John Duncan shivered and turned his coat collar up. Then, with his bright flowers in his hand, he walked on into the winter wind.